Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitshana Bemitzvota Vitzivana La Sok Bidibre Ora. Amen. Thank you. See what I can do. Up oh, there we are. And this is where we're continuing. And by the way, <laughs> we're still we're still on the first day. This is the third year we're doing this, and we're just finishing up the first day of creation. Vayikra Elohim laor yom, and God called the light day. V'lachoshech kara laila, and to the darkness he called night. Vayhi erev, vayhi boker, there was evening and there was morning. Yom Echad, one day, one day. And I don't know if anything uh, jumps out at you on that, that seems unusual about that sentence, but Rashi is going to pick it out for us. So, uh, right, let's go on. So our Rashi actually starts on uh, this page here. He goes right into it. Yom Echad, one day. The feast Seder Lashon HaParsha, according to the order of the language of this paragraph, this Parsha, Hayalo Lichtov Yom Mishon. This is the strange thing. It should have said a first day. It doesn't say Yom Rishon, it says Yom Echad. And uh, that is bizarre. And uh, why would it say Yom Echad, right? Why didn't it say Yom Rishon? So, Yom Rishon Kamosha Katuv B'Sha'ar Hayamim, just as is written in the other days, Sheini, right? In other words, Yom Echad is a cardinal number, Sheini, second, Shlishi, third, Rivi'i, fourth, etc. Those are ordinal numbers. Lama katav echad. So why did the Torah write one? The fishaya hakadosh baruch hu yachid be'olamo. Because at that moment, the Holy One, blessed be he, was the sole one in his world. He was unique, singular in his world. Shelo nivra'u hamalachim because the angels were not created ad yom sheni until the second day. Kach mefurash bevereshit rabba. This is how it's explained in Bereshit rabba. Bereshit rabba is a midrash. It is actually extant. A uh, little uh, ad plug. We are studying it on Wednesday evenings. Uh, and in fact, it has taken us nine years to get to the end of Bereshit, of just the Parsha of Bereshit, and we're on to Noah at this point. But um, it has amazing stuff in it, and we know already, of course, that Rashi refers to this. Bereshit Rabbah means, of course, Rabbah, Midrash Rabbah means the great Midrash. So, again, this, you know, we've answered a question, but in truth, We've raised other questions as well, because as I go through this year after year, I start to try to extrapolate uh, what is the, are there any underlying ideas that maybe we miss uh, because of the way in which we tend to look at things uh, scientifically or historically, as opposed to from a literary standpoint. And you know, I've sort of driven home this idea of approaching the Torah from a literary standpoint and not a historical or a scientific standpoint, that the Torah isn't trying to speak to us in that kind of language. And that in some ways, the language of the Torah is actually somewhat unique. And, and by the way, since I mentioned Midrash Rabbah, Midrash Rabbah is very sensitive to this. And we have in Midrash Rabbah the opinion of many Amoraim. These are rabbis that are mentioned in the Talmud, uh, discussing their interpretations of these various statements. So, 
here when we say, you know, what does it exactly mean to say that God was singular in his world? And my sense is that what we're talking about is relationship. We're talking about God's relationship to the world. And frankly, in general, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about the Torah. In other words, in a way, you know, to reflect that beautiful title of Heschel's God in Search of Man, right? That, that in, and there's been sometimes I've sort of used a metaphor of a grand experiment. That, that, and in answering the question or attempting to answer the question, why did God create the world in the first place, right? Uh, the Hasidim, apparently there's a Hasidic interpretation that's just beautiful that says God had a taiva, God had a lust to create the world. And, and, and what we're talking about is a, an appetite, an appetite, because appetites are not rational issues, they're impulses and have to do with deep, deep, you know, issues within our psyches as to why we want these particular things and why we have an appetite to do it. Uh, I'm thinking, of course, of an article that I read where people had to explain why they loved chocolate or why they loved a particular food. And after they actually sat down and thought to themselves exactly why did they like that particular food, some of them came up with a solution or the conclusion that they really didn't like that food that much, which to me just simply says, because appetites come from a different place. They're not a rational, they're not a rational uh, sense. They're not from the rational side of us. Um, at any rate, uh, the way I like to try and explain it sometimes is to say that God had decided to do this experiment to see that if God created human beings with all the gifts that human beings have, both uh, you know, both in terms of their own very makeup as human beings and the world in which they were put. And you know that sometimes uh, the, the tradition describes this world as prepared table, that this act of creation was God preparing the table for human beings to feast at and whether or not a, such a person, you know, creator or people created in this particular way would recognize their creator and be able to uh, live out lives of appreciation for these particular gifts at any rate. So it's an experiment. That's how I try to think about it. Onwards. Vayomer uh, <clears throat> Elohim, and God said, or God thought, remember? Yehi, let there be a rakia, a rakia, the tochamai within the water, or in the midst of the water, in the middle of the water. And the word rakia, um, it's hard to, I know that it's so often translated as firmament, but how well do we know what the word firmament means? Well, in trying to explain this word, the word rakia is related to the word rikuot. And rikuot has to do with the process of beating metal plates into very thin film. So rakia actually refers to, as it were, a film, a very thin film within the midst of the water. Vahi mavdil, and let it divide bein mayim lamayim from, because it's in the middle of this ocean, this water, Okay, let it, dis, let it divide between one water and uh, the other water, because now there's a division in the water. Uh, you have to see that we are speaking extremely poetically or metaphorically. This is not a scientific explanation of the physical creation of the world. I believe this is a description of the spiritual creation of the world. In other words, of, of the underlying spiritual issues uh, on which the world is based. And I, I have come to the conclusion, this is some years ago, that water represents divine judgment. And this is actually supported by the story of Noah and the flood. And this rakia, this thin film, has to do 
with the aspect of divine mercy that prevents the waters above from inundating the world. And uh, presumably the waters below also inundating the world and destroying human life. But when we're talking about this water here, we are talking about divine judgment. And it's not that I've read something somewhere. I have not come across a, another biblical interpreter uh, who obviously would have way more authority than I would. But on the other hand, when there are other places in the Torah, such as example, the Noah story, uh, which would tend to support the point that I'm trying to make. So again, if we're willing to move away from an overly literal understanding of the words we're reading, I think we will get far greater spiritual values from all of this. And we don't get involved in, well, the Torah really isn't describing nature and it's unscientific and all this kind of thing. It's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be. So we are talking here about the sense that the world does operate with a system of judgment and that there is accountability. And that's what's happening through this particular passage. I will go ahead and look at the Rashi on this. And you can see for yourselves whether there's a little bit of an allusion to what I'm saying in this Rashi. It's very little, I will tell you right now. So, Yehi Rakia. So that, that statement, let there be a firmament. So it's a major command, right? God is giving a command. And when God gives a command, when the creator of the universe gives a command, that is a powerful, powerful statement. So, Yechezak Harakia, let this film be strengthened. She'af alpi, because despite the fact that the heavens were created on the first day. Adaim lachim, this is supposed to be a lamed, lachim hayu. They were still very moist. They were very moist. Ve'yikrashu, and they congealed basheni on the second day. Miga'arat ha'kadosh baruch hu, from the... Um, uh, Ga'ara is like to yell at someone, right? From this, this uh, stern, uh, you know, command. But it, le, le ga'er means basically to correct someone and to, but to do it in a very harsh kind of way. So God sort of yelled at the waters, again, speaking poetically, right? But Omro, when he said, Yahi Rakia. So Rashi's understanding this Yehi Rakia to be not simply, oh yeah, let there be water, or let, let there be a firmament, excuse me. Vezesh Amar, and this is mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if this is Job, you may have, there's no reference here, but it could be, I'm not sure uh, where this reference is, and perhaps one of you has the reference uh, in, in an English translation that you have, or the text you have. And this is referred to when it says, Amude Shamayim Yerofafu, the pillars of heaven trembled, Kol Yom Rishon. This was, would have been all the first day. So this is the quotation, Amude Shamayim Yerofafu, that happened, Kol Yom Rishon, the entire first day. And again, if we allow our imaginations, to, to play with us a little bit and sort of seeing the, the tentative way in which the world came into existence, right? And on the second day, they were astounded, okay? From his stern command, Adam, very similar to like a person who remains confounded. In other words, he's shocked into, into the situation he's in, right? From the, the, the yelling, right, of the one that is uh, uh, driving fear into him, from the one who 
who, whom he fears, but Ma'ayim is the one who causes him to fear. So again, you know, stand back for a minute and ask yourself, what is this trying to tell us, right? That I'm, I'm thinking, right, as we're discussing this, is that in some ways, this is dealing with a very fundamental problem, because we know that the wicked prosper in this world, that there are times when the wicked prosper, and that in some ways, this, the emotional, the emotional uh, valency that is underneath this particular verse is that in some ways, you know, God was, there was a part of God, that part of God that would have demanded strict justice was angered. You know, that there's some level of anger here in the need to do this. And that when we, because we know, or, or perhaps we haven't discussed it yet, but the truth is that if, the, if this world operated according to the, the demands of absolute strict justice, it would mean that the moment someone sinned, when the moment someone acted perversely or wickedly, they would be punished immediately. And that isn't what happened. And we know, right, the principle of justice delayed is justice denied. So, but God realized that given the fact that the world had to be created with human beings being able to make freely the decision of whether or not they wanted to love God was crucial to the very creation of the world, that there'd be no point at all to the creation of the world if people didn't have that choice. And knowing that people had that choice, there was the risk always that people would choose to be unappreciative and unloving and the world would come to an end. So God had to build in this system of mercy, okay? Uh, so that people would not be punished despite the fact that they might deserve it uh, immediately, that people would be given time in which to do tshuva because repentance is such, in other words, the ability to learn from our mistakes to try to correct them is such a fundamental element of human existence and, and making life worthwhile. And so I, I see some of this particular dynamic going on uh, with what we're talking about here. The tochamai, in the midst of the water. So this toch means in the very middle of the waters because there is a distinction between the upper waters that are above the rakia okay and between the waters that are distant from this firmament that are the waters that are on the earth that are distant from the um, from this Rakia. Um, you know, this this is such a dense text that I still have to, you know, even though I feel that I've been able to work out just a few little things. Um, nevertheless, the question that I would have is, you know, the greater significance of the water that is on the earth. And again, as I'm raising the question, etc., we realize just how much water is necessary for the preservation of, our, of life. And if you ever, ever either read or watched the series by Abba Ibn uh, called Civilization and, and the Jews, Abba Ibn points out really very, very well, something I never learned in public school, was how controlling water supply, the ability to control one's water supply was the very foundation of civilization. That people could gather in one place that, that life that was totally nomadic no longer had to take place once people figured out how to make sure that there was a steady, steady amount of water in any given place and that this is the way city life started to develop and consequently civilization. Because when you're moving, you have other things you have to take care of. Um, and, and, and it's a lot of trouble, we know that, 
uh, I do certainly. Uh, and so being able to gather in one place, it allowed people to get together and commu form communities, have discussions, create music, the arts, etc., etc. Halamarata. So consequently, you can infer, you can learn, shehem tluyim, that these waters above were suspended by the command of a king, by divine command. So again the sense in which our lives are very, um, how can I put it, tentative, depending on how we behave. And of course, we are seeing in our own time, the effect of human neglect of natural, of the natural forces that are required to sustain life. And we realize that. So this is already being suggested here in these particular passages. And Again, one way of understanding a religious life is the question of how do we relate to the universe? Given our abilities as human beings, how do we choose to relate to the universe around us? In other words, to creation, to the story in some ways that we're reading about right now. How do we relate to it? And with this, I'm going to end this morning's class. So I'm going to put a marker. And before I stop the recording, if anyone would like to ask a question, make a point, uh, share a concern, uh, I'll wait a moment and let you do that if you want to. Does anybody want to share anything at this point? Okay, so I'll stop the share and I'll stop the recording. <laughs>